All right. Uh, hi, folks. Yeah, I think everything's going. I've got uh, – yeah, I think everything's going. <clears throat> I posted everywhere uh, to say I was going live. I'm going to do some uh, reading of anarchist history. Hopefully, I'm gonna. I'm just going to start with the wiki page, I think. I've got uh, – I'm going to bring up my – Share screen, Anarchist history. I got I got some links yesterday, so then uh, that can help. Hopefully, oh, Jesus, it's always like so small. Boom, boom, boom. All right, duck, duck, go. Anarchist history. Yeah. Um. So we're gonna start off with the wiki, the history of anarchism, and we'll switch to this tab instead. Holy fuck! Is it, is it ever small? What in the hell? Try and make it so you can actually see it on your screen. Yeah, okay. So we've got the history of anarchism. Uh, yeah, the history of anarchism is as ambiguous as anarchism itself. Scholars find it hard to agree on what it means. Anarchism and libertarian has brought political ideologies, manifest, manif manifold historical, contemporary meanings, have contested definitions. Yeah, I don't know how contested they actually are. <clears throat> but... Sure, there is a range of views on anarchism and its history. Some feel anarchism is a distinct, well-defined 19th and 20th century movement, while others identify anarchist traits long before first civilizations existed. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if anybody's watched um, the prehistory series that me and Damien do. We talk a lot about uh, how prehistory, like er, like before uh there was really states or like any uh, – even when the, the very first like uh, considered states were uh, – and how anarchism and uh, kind of – we kind of try and analyze it through like leftist sort of uh, – uh, leftist kind of vein or viewpoint. I just got a alert somewhere. It's impossible to find because I have 600 places that are open. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Oh, there we go. There it is. Somebody, somebody followed me. Good. Thank you. Um, all right. So as I was saying, oh my God, I have too many tabs open. Okay. So, uh, prehistoric society existed without formal hierarchies, uh, which some anthropologists have described as similar to anarchism. And again, uh, if you check out, uh, Damien Marie at Hope's YouTube channel, uh, a lot of the stuff we've talked about, um, yeah, about prehistory and early states, uh, we'll talk about some of that stuff. Um, the first traces of formal anarchist thought can be found in can be found in ancient Greece and China. Okay, where does that tell us? Okay, ancient Greece. That's just and China, where numerous philosophers questioned the necessity of the state and declared the right of the individual to live free from coercion. During the Middle Ages, some religious sects espoused libertarian thought, and the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, and the attendant rise of rationalism and science signaled the birth of the modern anarchist movement. Alongside Marxism, modern anarchism was a significant part of the workers' movement at the end of the 19th century. <sighs> Modernism, industrialization, reaction to capitalism, and mass migration helped anarchism to flourish and to spread around the globe. Major anarchist schools of thought sprouted up as anarchism grew as a social movement, particularly anarcho-collectivism, anarcho-communism, that's, that's the one I identify as, <laughs> syndicalism and individualist anarchism like uh i want to like for non-anarchists i do want to go through at some point and i just want to like examine the various types of anarchist because uh it doesn't make a lot of sense to non-anarchists honestly like uh the difference between anarcho-collectivism or anarcho-communism or uh, individualist anarchism they don't really understand where we're dividing those up like uh my friend renee uh he kind of joked that it seems like it's all just a bunch of like different sects, like uh, in Christianity, where like there's the sect that hates the sect, and like there's just different groups that are like espousing different ideologies, and and but it's all supposed to be under the rubric of Christianity. Well, this is all supposed to be under the rubric of anarchism, and it is sort of like that, but also there's reasons for why these things are, and they they mean things, so. So for non-anarchists, it'd be nice if we could at some point, if I could at some point, uh, maybe go through those a little bit better. 
So as the workers' movement grew, the divide between anarchists and Marxists grew as well. Yes, we all we all know some of this, right? If you're into Marxism or anarchism, you know some of this. Um, you've probably read, maybe, maybe you've read more than I have <laughs> about this. Uh, the two currents formally split at the Fifth Congress of the First International in 1872. Anarchists participated enthusiastically in the Ruf Russian Revolution, but as soon as the Bolsheviks established their authority, anarchist movements, most nob notably the Mankovichina and the Kronstadt Rebellion, were harshly suppressed. <laughs> yes, the Bolsheviks betrayed the anarchists. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there, that that will come into more detail in the uh, actual, like, breakdown. Anarchism played a historically prominent role during the Spanish Civil War, yeah, of course, when anarchists established the anarchist territory in Catalonia. Revolutionary Catalonia was organized along anarcho-syndicalist lines with powerful labor unions in the cities and collectivized agriculture in the country, but ended in the defeat of the anarchists. Yes, unfortunately. Uh, so in the 1960s, anarchism re-emerged as a global political and cultural force, particularly in association with the new left, uh, yeah, so if you know what the new left is, then that's a, a broad political movement made in the 60s and 70s, consisting of activists in the Western world who campaigned for a broad range of social issues such as civil and political rights, environmentalism, feminism, gay rights, gender roles, and drug policy reforms, so on and so forth. Might check the wiki for that at some point. But uh, yeah, since then, anarchism has influenced social movements that espouse personal autonomy and direct democracy. It has also played major roles in the anti-globalization movement, Zapatista Revolution, and the Rojava Revolution. All right, so we got the, the table of contents. I don't know how far into this I'll get. Um, kind of depends on how interesting it seems. I'm, I am going to do this again, so if I don't get too far into it, if I only stop at like 30 minutes or uh, 40 minutes or whatever, then... I will come back and I will pick up where I left off in two, uh, I guess, two weeks from now. Because that's that's my plan is every uh, every second Wednesday, Tuesday, I'll be doing anarchist history. Um, So there have been background. There has been some controversy over the definition of anarchism and hence its history. Uh, we've got one. Let's open that link in a new tab. I'm just going to pop over to that. So then, because I always like to go through kind of the... Carl Levy is a professor of politics at Goldsmiths College, University of London. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. What is this? That's a link to somewhere outside of the... Okay, let's open that in a new tab. Then we'll start. Oh, it's uh, it says the social histories of anarchism within, by Carl Levy. In lieu of an abstract, here's a brief excerpt of the content. So this is a paper. Uh, Journal for the Study of Radicalism, uh, Michigan State University Press, November 2nd, Fall 2010. How far does this go? Oh, I just get one page. That's all I get. Okay. Well, maybe I won't worry too much about that at the moment. I'm, I'll try and uh, maybe I can <laughs> get that off of like Sci-Hub or something. Maybe I can download a copy of this paper for free somewhere along the lines. That would be fucking great. All right. So where were we? One group of scholars considers anarchism strictly associated with class struggle. Others feel this perspective is far too narrow. And then there's some citations again. Levy again. McLaughlin. All right. Let's see what that says. So then we're on this one. So then this goes to anarchism and authority, a philosophical introduction to classical anarchism. Um, ah, so that takes me to the Google, Google books. I apologize. I, I, my brain does this uh, thing where I have to jump. I have to follow every thread if I can. Like I just, it's very, it's very frustrating. But uh, and I'm sure it's very frustrating for you, the the viewer. I, I just have to follow the threads at least as much as I can. Um, a philosophical approach to anarchism. This is from. Uh, this was written in, by Paul McLaughlin, in I think it said 2007 is what it said. Yeah, 2007. So maybe maybe I'll check I'll check that out here after after I'm done this. So I'm going to switch back to the initial page. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I'm just that's how it works. I have to follow the threads if I can. While the former group examines our anarchism as a phenomenon that occurred during the 19th century, the latter group looks to ancient history to trace anarchism's roots. 
Uh, citation number four, that's Levy 2010 again. So that's the same paper, that's uh, Carl Levy's paper that's been cited a couple times. Anarchist philosopher Murray Bookchin, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with on some level. I'll open that link up in another page. Describes the continuation of the legacy of freedom of humankind, i.e. the revolutionary movements that existed throughout history, in contrast with the legacy of domination, which consists of states, capitalism, and other organizational forms. That's McLaughlin, 2007 citation. <clears throat> okay, so, yeah, okay. I mean, that seems accurate to me. Anarchist book chain describes the continuation of the legacy of freedom of humankind. Yeah, I mean, anarchism is the fight for freedom. That's literally just what it is, isn't it? Like, uh, the three most common forms of defining anarchisms are the etymological, anarchy, or without a ruler, but anarchism is not merely a negation. The anti-statism, um, okay, so there's the etymological and then the anti-statism, which this seems to be pivotal. It certainly does not describe the essence of anarchism. I think that's not true. <laughs> I think that's, anti-statism is at, at the S, is part of this, the core of, uh, of anarchism, like, yeah. Uh, and the anti-authoritarian or definition which is a denial of every kind of authority, which oversimplifies anarchism. Uh, sort of. I mean, some some anarchists do adhere to that. Right? So that's Le uh, Carl Levy, 2010, and McLaughlin, 20, 2007. Along with the definition debates, the question of whether it's a philosophy, a theory, or a series of actions complicates the issue. It's all of them. I, I don't know why they have to say this or this or this. It's all of them. It's a philosophy, a theory, and a series of actions. <laughs> <laughs> you really, I don't know why this has to be, uh, D Acosta 2009. So that's a new citation. I'm going to, I'm going to, Oh, can I just follow that link? The one that comes up. I don't have to, I don't have to open the, the link to the citations at the bottom of the page. So open link in a new tab. This is going to share this tab. This is everything's so small. I look at it on the screen. Uh, so we got contemporary anarchist studies and introductory Anthology of Anarchy in the Academy. Looks like quite a list of uh, um, authors, writers in their political science book. Uh, might have to try and look for a free PDF of that as well. But we shall see. Okay, back to the history. I'm sorry. Am I jumping around too much? <laughs> this seems like I'm jumping around too much. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. Philosophy Professor Alejandro de Agosta proposes that anarchism is a decentralized federation of philosophies as well as practices and ways of life forged in different communities and affirming diverse geo-histories. That does seem accurate. So we've got precursors. Uh, main article, precursors to anarchism. Is there another wiki page that's specifically like precursors to anarchism? Sure looks like. Prior to the rise of anarchism as an anti-authoritarian political philosophy in the 19th century, both individuals and groups expressed some principles of anarchism in their lives, lives and writings. So then that, that goes through a lot of that stuff. But that's not, I might go through some of that later. Um, let me know if you have any interest in the actual, like, if I'm going through this wiki page as well. There's lots of stuff on all of these things. So it's like, it's, I don't know, I find it very interesting, but maybe we won't, don't have to go in depth into all of it. Uh, so we got the prehistoric and ancient era. Uh, many scholars of anarchism, including anthropologists Harold Barclay and David Graeber, claim that some form of anarchy dates back to prehistory, the longest period of human existence, that before the recorded hu history of human society was without a separate class of established authority or formal political institutions. Graham, Ross, so there's a couple, a couple citations that I'll I'll, I'll try not to go follow every citation in this. It's going to take forever. But at some point, I do want to read some of these citations as well. Uh, long before anarchism emerged as a distinct perspective, humans lived for thousands of years in self-governing societies without a special ruling or political class. It was only the rise of hierarchical societies that anarchist ideas were formulated as a critical response to and a rejection of the coercive political institutions and hierarchical social relationships. Barclay, 1990. That's also Barclay, 1990. Ross, Graham. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> lots, lots to read, I think. Um, 
Taoism, which uh, developed in ancient China, has been linked to anarchist thought by some scholars. Taoist sages Lao Tzu and Zuo, Zhuang Zhu, Zhuang Zhao, I think that's right, uh, whose principles were grounded in an anti-polity stance and in a rejection of any kind of involvement in political movements or organizations, developed a philosophy of non-rule in the Tao Te Ching and in and the Zung, Zhuangzi. I'm not sure. I haven't. I haven't heard much about uh, that one. I might have to. An ancient Chinese text from the late Warring States period, 476 to 221 BC, which contains stories and anecdotes that exemplify the carefree nature and the ideal Taoist sage, named for its traditional author, Master Zhuang. Zhuang. Interesting. That's interesting. I did not. I was not aware of this. Taoists were trying to live in harmony with the nature. Citation Marshall and Rap. There is an ongoing debate whether exhorting rulers not to rule is somehow an anarchist objective. Yes. <laughs> what do you, okay. A new generation of Taoist thinkers with anarchic leanings appeared during the chaotic Weijin period. Taoism and Neo Taoism had principles more akin to a philosophical anarchism an attempt to delegitimize the state and question its morality, and were pacifist schools of thought in contrast with their Western counterparts some centuries later. Okay. Some convictions and ideas deeply held by modern anarchists were first expressed in ancient Greece. The first known political usage of the word anarchy, ancient Greek, I'm not going to try and read that, appeared in plays by uh, people whose names I don't think I can pronounce. Uh, Sophocles? Uh, and somebody else. <laughs> in the 5th century BC, ancient Greece also saw the first Western instance of anarchy as a philosophical ideal, mainly, but not only, by the Cynics and the Stoics. The Cynics, Diogenes of Sinope and Crates of Thebes, are both supposed to have advocated for anarchistic forms of society, although there little remains of their writings. Their most significant contribution was the radical approach of Nomos and Physis. Contrary to the rest of Greek philosophy, aiming to blend nomos and physis in harmony. Cynics dismissed nomos and, in consequence, the authorities, hierarchies, establishment, and moral code of polis while promoting a way of life based solely on physis. This seems like I should. So, nomos is law, physis is nature. Okay. So, basically, we're saying, like, contrary to the rest of Greek philosophy, which aimed to blend law and nature in harmony, cynics dismissed the law. And by consequence, authorities, hierarchies, establishments, and moral codes of the polis, uh, while promoting a way of life based solely on nature. Uh, Zeno of Citium, the founder of Stoic Stoicism. Well, that's interesting. I don't know that much about Stoicism. I always, uh, I always kind of thought it was the assholes uh, <laughs> philosophy because I don't always the because for so long when I saw it, it was people being assholes who were like, "Oh, why are you getting so upset?" This is, you should work, follow Stoicism. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the founder of Stoicism, who was much influenced by the cynics, described his vision of an egalitarian utopian society around 300 BC. Zeno's Republic advocates a form of anarchic society where there is no need for state structures. He argued that although the necessary instinct for self-preservation leads humans to egotism, Nature has supplied a corrective to it by providing man with another instinct, namely sociability. Like many modern anarchists, he believed that if people follow their instincts, they will have no need of law, courts, or police, no temples and no public worship, and use no money, free gifts taking the place of monetary exchanges. Generally, yeah, I, I generally agree with that. I think I think it's it's tough to imagine because of the way that we've already got, like our society has been working for the last however many uh, hundreds of years. But yeah, I think generally that's how things will should work and could work. I don't I don't I think that as most anarchists, I think that the hierarchical power structures that are in place limit that ability of ours to just be and share and care about each other and also just be free and just live. <laughs> so so yeah, states fuck with it. Uh states, capitalism, it fucks with it, right? Uh, Socrates expressed some views appropriate to anarchism. He constantly questioned authority, and at the center of his philosophy stood every man's right to freedom of consciousness. 
Aristippus, a pupil of Socrates and founder of the hedonistic school, claimed that he did not wish either to rule or to be ruled. He saw that the, saw the state as a danger to personal autonomy. Uh, not all ancient Greeks had anarchic tendencies, obviously. Other philosophers, such as Plato and Aristotle, used the term anarchy negatively in, associ in association with democracy, which they mistrusted as inherently vulnerable and prone to deterioration into tyranny. Uh, this is something that this is a pretty common objection you see from uh, like liberals or like uh, centrists right now, uh, or, or conservatives for sure. Like they think all of it is any, anything that isn't their view is tyranny. But um, among the ancient precursors of anarchism are often ignored movements within ancient Judaism and early Christianity. As more contemporary literature shows, anti state and anti hierarchy positions can be found in the Tanakh as well as in New Testament texts. That's interesting stuff. I think, uh, let's see how long is it? Yeah, I'll go. I can keep going. I'm at, at 23 minutes. I've been on. I, I I don't know how long I just want to sit here and read a wiki page on, on uh, Twitch stream. But as long as, you know, it looks like somebody's, yeah, as long as somebody's enjoying it, I guess. All right. So in the Middle Ages. So that was like prehistoric and ancient era. There's lots there to go through, I think. Like it'd be worth... It'd be really worth uh, examining, like the Taoist stuff, and like it really seems like, uh, yeah, there's probably some very valuable insights in uh, into uh, like freedom or liberation type movements uh, in, say, the Tao Te Ching or or uh, Taoist movements, Taoism. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Middle Ages. In Persia, during the Middle Ages, a Zoroastrian prophet named Mazdak, now considered a proto-socialist, called for the abolition of private property, free love, and overthrow, overthrowing the king. Hey, shit, yeah, sounds good. He and his thousands of followers were massacred in 582 CE, Ugh, of course, but his teaching influenced Islamic sects in the following centuries. A theological pre predecessor to anarchism developed in Basra, and Baghdad among uh, Mudazilite Aztec ascetics. It was an Islamic group that appeared in early Islamic history and were known for their neutrality in the dispute between Ali and his opponents after the death of the third Caliph Uthman by the 10th century CE. The term had come to refer to the Islamic school of spec speculative theology. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel like if I try these names, I'm just going to butcher them and, and it's almost going to be on the level of insulting. But uh, So this form of revolutionary Islam was not communist or egalitarian. It did not resemble concept, current concepts of anarchism, but preached that the state was harmful, illegitimate, immoral, and unnecessary. Okay? I mean, he's got it partly right, right? Like a lot of people aren't, a lot of anarchists, modern anarchists aren't communists or egalitarians. They're just like, like in nihilism isn't necessarily an egalitarian movement or ideology. It's like, I mean, I disagree with most of nihilism, but I don't want to, I don't want to like frame it badly. I don't want to like misrepresent it. So um, in Europe, Christianity was overshadowing all aspects of life, of life. The brethren of the free spirit was the most notable example of heretic belief that had some big anarchistic tendencies. Okay. They held their anti-cleric, sentiments and believed in total freedom. In Europe, Christianity was overshadowing all aspects of life. Yes. The brethren of the free spirit. Okay. Adherents of a loose set of beliefs deemed heretical by the Catholic Church, but held by some Christians, especially in the Low Countries, Germany, France, Bohemia, and Northern Italy between the 13th and 15th centuries. Okay. Uh, they held anti-cleric sentiments and believed in total freedom, even though most of their ideas were individualistic. The movement had a social impact, instigating riots and rebellions in Europe for many years. Marshall, 1993, Marshall mentions the English Peasants' Revolt in 1381, the Hussite Revolution in Bohemia and Tabor, 1419 to 1421, the German Peasants' Revolt. Okay, interesting. Cool. Other, anarchist, other anarchistic religious movements in Europe during the Middle Ages included the Hussites and Adamites, or a Czech proto-Protestant movement. And these guys were adherents of an early, early adherents of an early Christian group in North Africa in the second, third, and fourth centuries. They wore no clothing, no, no clothing during their religious service, 
there were later reports of similar sects in Central Europe during the late Middle Ages. Okay. So that's this group. Like it wasn't, we're not talking about the, the people in Africa. We're talking about the Central Europe guys. 20th century historian James Joel described anarchism as two opposing sides. In the Middle Ages, zeolotic and ascetic religious movements emerged, which rejected institutions, laws, and the established order. In the 18th century, another anarchist stream emerged based on rationalism and logic. These two currents of anarchism later blended to form a contradictory movement that resonated with a very broad audience. Okay, so Joel wrote in 1975. That's interesting. The Anarchists. I'm going to open that link in a new tab. I'd like to check that out. The book, The Anarchists by James Joel. Okay, I think, I think I'll check that out. So now we're up to Renaissance and the early modern era. I know most people probably don't think of this uh, prehistory stuff or this ancient stuff as like anarchist history, but I, fi I find the long, the length of it to be quite useful. I find it to be very helpful uh, in understanding the way that modern uh, anarchist ideas have kind of just been around and there's always been people uh who believed in these things. Uh, so Renaissance and the early modern era. So that we've got a couple of links. I'm going to open those in new tabs. Christian anarchism. That seems like a contradiction in my head, but I'm interested in uh, hearing what they have to say. With the spread of the Renaissance across Europe, anti-authoritarian and secular ideas re-emerged. The most prominent thinkers advocating for liberty, mainly French, were employing utopia in their works to bypass strict state censorship. In Gargantua and Pantagruel, okay, a pen, penta, penta, all, pen, a pentalogy, pentalogy. <laughs> you ever read words sometimes and just feel dumb because you're like, this seems like it should be something I can say. Uh, <laughs> is a pentalogy of novels written in the 16th century by Francois, Francois Rabelais telling the adventures of two giants, Gargantua and his son, Pantagruel. The work is written in an amusing, extravagant, and satirical vein. Okay, interesting. Francois Rabelais wrote of Abbey of Thelema, from coin Greek, meaning will or wish, an imaginary utopia whose motto was do as thou will. Around the same time, French law student Etienne de la Boite wrote his discourse Discourse on Voluntary Servitude. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open that in another one. Where he argued that tyranny resulted from voluntary submission and could be abolished by the people refusing to obey the authorities above them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's interesting. I mean, voluntary submission in what way, though? Like, that's the question. That's the trouble with uh, placing the blame on the victim is uh, how much of it is that they are voluntary. Uh, like, coercion is pretty fucking heavy-handed sometimes. Um, later still in France, Gabriel de Fouigny perceived a utopia with freedom-loving people without government and no need of religion, as he wrote in The Southern Land. The Southern Land Known is a book by yeah, 1676. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to open that in a new tab. For this, Geneva authorities jailed de Fouigny, uh, Francois, Francois Felenon, Fenelon also used Utopia to project his uh, political views in the book Les Aventures de Telemé. Mm -hmm. Interesting. The Archbishop of Cambrai, who came in 16, 1689, became tutor to the seven-year-old Duke de... I'm so fucking English. Like, <laughs> I can't read any name that isn't English. I'm so... It's so bad. Uh... Apparently, so this book infuriated Louis the Fourteenth. Mm -hmm. uh, some Reformation currents, like the radical reformist movement of the An Anabaptists. Oh, I've heard of that. I've heard of that Protestant Christian movement, which traces its origins to the radical Reformation. Let's open that in a new tab. Are sometimes credited as the religious forerunners of modern anarchism, even though the Reformation was a religious movement and strengthened the state. So that doesn't seem like it's fits very well. It also opened the way for the humanistic values of the French Revolution, which is um, worth reading about sometime. Like that's, I've, uh, I think Seriously Wrong did a really interesting uh, uh, kind of 
two parter, maybe three. I, I can't remember how many parts it was, uh, on, uh, the French revolution. Very cool stuff. Uh, so during the English civil war, Christian anarchism found one of its most articulate exponents in Gerard Winstanley, who was part of the diggers movement. He published a pamphlet, the law of right, new law of righteousness, calling for communal ownership and social and economic organization in small agrarian communities. Drawing on the Bible, he argued that the blessings of the earth should be common to all and none lord over others. Mm -hmm. Not bad. William, William Blake has also been said to have been espoused an anarchistic political position. In the New World, the first to use the term anarchy to mean something other than chaos was Louis Armand Baron de la, la Hontan and his very French-looking Nouveau Voyages dans l'Amérique Septentrion, Septentrionale. Uh, so 1703, New Voyages in North America uh, would be, I guess, the translation. He inscribed Indigenous American society as having no state, laws, prisons, priests, or private property, as in, as being in anarchy. Um, yeah, okay. In the New World, the first to use the term anarchy to mean something other than chaos. Wow, but See, that's the question. Does, does he mean something other than chaos? Because it, it sounds like, like without reading it, I'm not entirely sure of his, uh, his intent. Oh, well. Oh, well. The Quaker sect, mostly known mostly because of their anti-hierarchical governance and social relations based on their beliefs of the divine spirit universally within all people and humanity's absolute equality, had some anarchistic tendencies. Such values have, must have influenced Benjamin Tucker, who is who? The editor, oh, okay, Benjamin Tucker, that's an early anarchist. The editor and publisher of the individualist anarchist periodical Liberty. Very cool. <clears throat> that was written by Anarchism, a history of, that looks cool. Let's open that up. <laughs> um, okay, so then we're on to, we've gone through Middle Ages, prehistory, ancient Middle Ages. Renaissance and early modern era. When was Benjamin Tucker? Uh, was an American individualist anarchist and libertarian socialist. Tucker was the editor and publisher of the American individualist anarchist periodical Liberty, 1881 to 1908. Tucker was a member of the first international while describing his form of anarchism. I'm going to open that in a new tab. I've got a lot of tabs open now. Almost too many. <laughs> Oopsie. Oop. All right. Developments of the 18th century. Modern anarchism grew from the secular and humanistic thought of the Enlightenment. Okay. But didn't we just say like 1881? Okay. 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 The scientific discoveries that preceded the Enlightenment gave t thinkers the time confident of the time confidence that humans can reason for themselves. When nature was time tamed through science, society could be free, could be set free. The development of anarchism was strongly influenced by the works of Jean Meslier, Baron de Holbach, and whose material world materialistic worldview later resonated with anarchists. Okay, so let's look let's open these guys up. <clears throat> and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, okay, yeah. Like I think pretty much everybody has heard of Rousseau, especially in his discourse on inequality. Okay, let's uh, open that up too and arguments for the moral centrality of freedom. Rousseau affirmed the goodness in nature of men and viewed the state as fundamentally oppressive. Denis, Dider Denis Diderot, uh, Supplement au Voyage de Bougainville, or the Supplement to the Voyage of Bougainville, was also influential. Okay. Okay. Interesting. The French Revolution stands as a landmark in the history of anarchism. The use of the revolutionary violence by Matt use of revolutionary violence by the masses would captivate anarchists of later centuries with such events as the Women's March on Versailles, cool, the storming of the Bastille, cool, and the the riots which name whose name I cannot say. Uh Revelin riots. Okay, let's open that too. Seen as the revolutionary archetype, anarchists came to identify with the the en enraged ones. Okay. Or ultra radicals. Interesting. I'm going to open that in a new tab too. I got a lot of reading to do here. This is going to take many, many days. <laughs> I guess it's a good thing. It's a good thing, right? 
uh, anarchists who came to identify with the enrages, uh, who expressed the demands of the sans culottes, common people of the lower classes in the late 18th century. Without breaches, commoners who opposed revolutionary government as a contradiction in terms. Yeah, I agree. Denouncing the Jacobin dictatorship. Hmm, interesting. Hmm. Jean Varlet wrote in 1794 that government and revolution are incompatible unless the people wish to set its constituted authorities in permanent insurrection against itself. In his Manifest de Ego, or Manifesto of the, uh, the Equals of 1801, Sylvain Marchal looked forward to the disappearance, once and for all, of the revolting distinction between rich and poor, of great and small, of masters and valets, of governors and governed. The French Revolution became, came to depict in the minds of anarchists that as soon as rebels seize power, they become the new tyrants, <laughs> as evidenced by the state-orchestrated violence of the Reign of Terror. Aha! Uh -huh. That's, uh, yep. Yeah. The proto-anarchist groups of Enreges and Saint-Culottes were ultimately executed by guillotine. Hmm. Almost like the thing they said was true. Because, mm-hmm. You start calling tyrants tyrants and they, like, cut off your head. The debate over the effects of the French Revolution on the anarchist cause continues to this day. To anarchist historian Max Netlow, uh, French revolutions did nothing more than reshape and modernize the militaristic state. Russian revolutionary and anarchist thinker Peter Kropotkin, however, traced the origins of the anarchist movement to the struggle of the revolutionaries. In a more moderate approach, the independent scholar Sean Sheehan points out that French Revolution proved that even the strongest political establishments can be overthrown. I, I mean, yeah, I guess that is a pretty good uh, conclusion to draw from that. What do we got? We got William Godwin in England was the first to develop an expression of modern anarchist thought. He is generally regarded as the founder of the school of thought known as philosophical anarchism, which is something I would like to cover in another discussion uh, or reading session or what have you. Uh, he argued in political justice that government was has an inherently malevolent influence on society and that it perpetuates dependency and ignorance. He thought the spread of the use of reason to the masses would eventually cause the government to weather away as an unnecessary fo force. Although he did not accord the state with moral legitimacy, he was against the use of revolutionary tactics for removing a government from power. Rather, he advocated for its replacement through a process of peaceful evolution. His aversion to the imposition of a rules-based society led him to denounce as a manifestation of the people's mental enslavement the foundations of law, property rights, and even the institution of marriage. Mm -hmm. He considered the basic foundations of society as constraining the natural development of individuals to use their powers of reasoning to arrive at, mutually beneficial, at a mutually beneficial method of organization. In each case, government and its institutions are shown to constrain the development of one's capacity to live wholly in accordance with the full and free exercise of private judgment. Okay. Um, I'm going to call it a day for this. Um, so then next time I'll pick it back up on Proudhon and Sterner. Um, let's see let's tab on Proudhon just quickly. So Proudhon was, uh, born in, uh, 1809 and, looks like he died in 1865 so he wrote about things <laughs> uh in 1848 he wrote uh so there's this is kind of in the middle of where we're at like uh oh my goodness there we go okay there so this is kind of in the middle of where uh the same the 1800s the same type of uh developments of the 18th century so yeah Revolutions of 1848, classical anarchism, there's lots to go, emergence of anarcho-communism, lots to go. And like, like I say, like I'm going to probably just go through the wiki for a while, and then I'm going to go through other wiki pages. Like this, to me, uh, I know that Wikipedia isn't like a, what do you call it, a uh, academic resource. But at the same time, I do find that it's helpful it, it gives you a broad understanding. It has citations if you want more information. Um, I will, I'll post the, the link in the, the show notes when I, uh, when I post this on YouTube. Um, 
just the one link for the, the main article that I'm going through. Everything else, I will collect these links and I will uh, go through them at, on, at other times. So thanks very much uh, for, uh, for being with me. Anybody who uh, was on the stream, it looks like myself, <laughs> just the one guy. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's okay. Hopefully some people will enjoy, uh, will get something out of this later. And if you don't, uh, maybe you'll join me later for a, a different, uh, for different content. Remember like every second Monday, I'm going to be doing examining of claims, uh, that I find on the internet. Uh, I'm going to like go through and try and read a few articles, try and get a, a basic understanding of what's going on with them, uh, where the stories come from, what they, what they are, uh, what people are actually talking about. Um, and then on Tuesdays, it's anarchist history. And then on, oh, <laughs> I can't even remember it because it's on my calendar. I don't have to remember it. But on uh, on Wednesdays, it's going to be, oh, I'm going to stream uh, talking about current events. Uh, so that's tomorrow. I'm going to take a look at some of the news items that come out the next couple, the last couple days, uh, probably the last few weeks, maybe. And I'm just going to kind of, you know, go through them, maybe. I'll try and get some stuff from around uh, various regions. And then on Thursday, it's Theory Thursday. I'm going to read uh, some piece of anarchist theory. Um, I don't know if I'll get through. Like, I'll probably just read one thing or two things. And then, uh, yeah. Anyway, we've got quite a bit of what quite a bit of reading to do on the history of anarchism. Um, because contrary to popular belief, this is not just a fucking tiny little movement that doesn't exist. Uh, it's been a major uh, political philosophy for a long time, and it's it's got a lot of aspects to it and a lot of history behind it. And frankly, I think people who who dismiss anarchism are essentially just uh, I don't know. It's one thing to disagree with it or to, or to uh, to not feel like it's uh, justified or will work. But to just dismiss it as uh, uh, the way that some do, as uh, simplistic and and uh, like people dismiss it out of hand because they associate the word anarchy with chaos, and that's not an accurate. That's an ignorant thing to do. That's uh, and I don't mean that as an insult. That's literally an ignorant thing to do. It's a thing that you do out of ignorance. Uh, so so yeah, we will uh, we'll pick this up again in two weeks. Thanks for checking this out. Hopefully I'll see you soon.